God for the, for the announcements, everything that's done. Please now help me welcome our pastor for the best part of the service. Give her a hearty amen as she comes. Well, it's good to be here today. The Lord is good. We didn't just have to be here. Thank God. Thank God. We're happy for all of you that are here. A special welcome to all of our visitors. We're glad that you came to this church this morning. I will guarantee you, you'll either like me at the end of it or, won't, or can't stand me. <laughs> I can deal with that. But I guarantee you, you'll have something to make you think when you leave this building. So we're happy that you're here. We're so glad to have Terry here and his mother. God bless you. And uh, we're still praying and holding on to God and the will of God to be done in this situation with their daughter. Uh, so and continue to, to pray for them, uh, for their strength, that God would be with them, and he will be. So it's good to be here this morning and doing all that I can for the kingdom of God. Uh, I look at so many things that have happened and realize if it hadn't been for God, we wouldn't even be here. And that is so true. And so I am grateful that he loved me enough to bring me to this place and this time in my life. So we're thankful for you being here. Hope that you came with an open heart and a mind to receive because God always has something good for his people. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Micah, the seventh chapter. Father, we're so grateful this morning for your blessings. We thank you because nobody ever loved us like you. We thank you because you've been there when nobody else was there. We thank you for Calvary and for all that it represents for us today. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that blessed our lives, that changed us into the people that we are today. I pray, God, that you will continue to reach out to your people and touch them in a special way. And I pray, God, for Ashley, that your will would be done for her this morning because you never make a mistake. You do all things well. And we thank you for it right now. And I pray for every person that's here today that they might receive, that they might be healed of whatever their infirmities are. And we'll give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The seventh chapter of Micah and the second verse says, The good man is perished out of the earth, and there is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. That they may do evil with both hands earnestly, the prince asketh and the judge asketh for a reward. And the great man, he uttereth, his mischievous desire, so they wrap it up. The best of them is as a briar, and the most upright is sharper than a thorn, of, a thorn hedge. And the day of thy watchman and thy visitation cometh. Now shall be their, now shall be their uh, perplexity. Trust ye not in a friend. Put ye not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of your mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonoreth the father, and the daughter riseth up against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Therefore I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. I want to preach to you a little while this morning. As I looked at this scripture, I thought when it says, when it got to the point, it's talking about where are the good people? Where are they? That we are seeing fewer and fewer good people. And I thought, and then those few that are around, negative things are said about them. Now, when I say few, we're talking about the whole earth here, and a few in the midst of that, all those people. But what it gets on down to the fifth verse says, don't trust in a friend. Now, many of us have had people that we called our friend. We really believe they were our friend. How many people here this morning actually would say that at some point in time in your life, the person you thought was your friend, you found out they were not? Who is it? Yes. Yes. Nothing is worse than that. And people experience a lot of pain as a result because we trust our friend. And then if we wake up one day and that friend is no longer there and that friend is the one that's causing us pain, that's a troubling factor. 
And so I said to every person this morning, some people don't ever, ever get over that. I had, she was my best friend that you thought she was your best friend. She was the best person that God ever put in my life. You thought that. And sometimes we wake up to the realization that it's not true. And so when I looked at that, it goes on as far as to say, keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. Talking about your wife, could be your girlfriend. She shouldn't be laying in your bosom anyway. <laughs> yes. That's okay if your wife is in your bosom. Your girlfriend shouldn't be there. He said, keep your mouth because the one laying in your bosom is a problem. And we seem to trust those people laying in our bosom. We're close. This is my girlfriend. This is my fiance. This is this and this is that. Until they do something that shocks you to death. And I want to say to you this morning that there's one way to be healed of betrayal, and that way is God. As a pastor, I thought this morning, uh, having been in the ministry now for some 40-some years, I thought to myself, boy, I can't even count the people that betrayed me. There are so many of them. But the thing that I love about it most is that I have not let, I have not let it change me. It didn't put me in a state that I'm not going to trust anybody. You can trust somebody, but you better be sure that somebody you trust knows God. Because if we love God, we won't be so quick to hurt somebody. There's a lot of pain in this world, a lot of hurt. I can't tell you all the people I've counseled over the years that have been hurt by somebody. Maybe it's a husband, maybe it's a wife, a friend, or, or, or a co-worker. Many people said, I never dreamed they would do this to me. I never thought they would say that about me. I never believed that they would do this or do that. Let me tell you something. We're living in a time more and more we better be more cautious. More cautious of who we allow to come in. Not just be open to any and everything, but let me be cautious that I don't find myself in a position where I'm being stabbed to death by a friend. And so I thought about Jesus when he got ready to go to Calvary. He, I mean, Judas, he referred to him as a friend. And can you imagine you're getting ready to die for somebody that you call a friend to, to find out Right after that, that he betrays you. And, he, and he, he, he betrayed him for such a little price. He didn't value him. Because then he said to the, to the Pharisees, he said, okay, how much, how much will you give me to deliver him to you? And they said 30 pieces of silver. That was a little bit of money. We looked it up one time. It amounts in, the, in, in English to about uh, $2.67. He didn't, he didn't value him at all. So you're going to sell him out, say this is the one you want to crucify, and just give me $2.67 and we'll, and we'll get the job done. Do you know how many people are accepting bribes today on people that they call their friends and people or co-workers and all this thing? If you'll just say that you saw this, if you'll just say you did this, then, then, then we'll have a case. I'm telling you. I never believed in all my life that people could lie as strong as they're lying in, in this election year. Well, I have seen so many liars until I'm starting to think, do any of y'all tell the truth? Anybody. They started out on the Republican side with 16 uh, uh, candidates. They talked about each other so bad. I couldn't be in that world. I'm telling you, I couldn't be in it. They talked about each other so bad, and at the end of the day, he's a good man. How is that? You just told me how bad he was. You just told me what a crook he is. Marco, Marco Rubio said the other day, uh, yeah, he's running in Washington now to try to get back into, into, his, uh, into his Senate seat. And he says, and, and they told him he needs to do this, otherwise a, uh, a Democrat might get it, and we don't need them to, over, to, to overpower us. And so he said, I called him a con artist, talking about Donald Trump. And he said, I still believe that, but I'm going to vote for him. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm trying to understand 
do you care about what's happening in this country or it's just all politics? I'm starting to believe it's all politics because I've never heard such liars. You're one lie after another, you're no good. Uh, you talked about him over here. You talked about Ted Cruz's daddy. You talked about this. So I'm thinking, what's wrong with these people? I mean, we have never had such a political season as we have now. And that's probably because Donald Trump said it. But I'm telling you, it is a tragedy. And so I look at these people and I think, how are you going to come back and say, I love you, great guy, think you're doing a great job. All this stuff, after I called you a dog, crooked-legged hook, and, and all this and all this stuff. Come on, for God's sake. Where, where are the men and women of truth? Where are they? You can't always trust what nobody tells you. People can lie so well. Look you straight in the eye and tell a lie and never blink. I counseled somebody in our church some years, many years ago. That's not here today, but I counseled them about an issue. It was two people sitting there. There was a young lady and there was this guy. And she told her part of the story. And he said, that's not true. And I sat there for a minute. This man had a face. It was so sad. If God wasn't God, he could have fooled God. That man was sitting there saying to me, no, Sister Rose, how can you say that? That's not true. I'm looking at her. I look back at him. And finally it hit me. I said, what would she have to gain to come forward and tell this about you? What does she have to gain? You're sitting here telling her bad lies. Can you believe this? I've seen some liars in churches. Don't you get me twisted? You don't be around this long, folks, and look at you and say they saved, say they have Christian liars and stray. So, so when I counsel now, I go to people, I say to them, now I'm getting ready to ask you a question. And before you answer, think. Think first. Because the first instinct that comes to people when they are in a situation and they want to get out of it, the first thing they do is say, oh, no, Sister Rose, no. I said, don't answer me for a minute. Wait. Just wait a minute. Think this one through. And then they start looking buckeye. <laughs> like, I don't want to think. I just want to tell this lie real quick and get it over with. <laughs> but I look at this and I'm thinking, God, we need people we can trust. We need people in our lives that we can trust. We need people in ministry that we can trust. That if you turn your back as a pastor, you don't have to worry about it. We don't have a lot of those people anymore. I have some in this church, and then I have some that I probably uh, wouldn't turn my back for a second. But understand that the betrayal factor is the most painful thing that any person could go through. And sometimes it can literally make a person internalize the, their feelings and emotions until where they can't even express themselves just on an everyday basis. It's unbelievable. And you should say to God this morning, Lord, I don't ever want to be the person who betrays my friend, betrays my wife, betrays my husband. I don't want to be that person. Because I tell you, the way it feels, the pain is so bad, until I really say, Lord, before, before, uh, 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 if, I'm, if there's going to be some betraying going on here, I would rather that, that, that you do it to me than me do it to you. Because I think it's horrible. And we see more of it and more of it every day. You got to understand we're living in a world where people are about themselves. I was listening briefly before I came to church this morning, and two of these uh, writers had wrote a book about Trump. And uh, I do want to get that book. I don't know if I have time to read it. But uh, it talks about his pattern, that everything you see today is that. And that one thing that stood out to me when he said, it's always about Donald Trump. He says, uh, if he wins, it's not about you. It's about Donald Trump. And so he said he's always been that way. It's a pattern over his whole life. If, if he loses, it's somebody else's fault. If he loses, it's somebody else messed up and the, and the system is rigged. So he sets the stage for this. But you know for sure, how can I believe you? 
How can I trust what you say? Are you for real or you're not? Or are you just saying something because that's the thing to say? That's where you see a lot of people. I'm just saying it because it sounds good. It would make me look like I'm a nice person if I put it like this. It would make me look like that I'm, a, I'm this good person if I say it this way. No, we want to be for real. Let's get real. Let's get real with each other. Not saying things that sound good to somebody else. Is this really me? Is this really who I'm talking about? Nothing is worse than thinking you know somebody only to wake up and realize Somebody say something to you or do something to you or cause you some bad pain and you stand back and say, you did this? I can't believe it. I cannot believe it. And people go for years dealing with the pain of betrayal, trying to get past it, trying to understand I would have never done this to you. How did you do it to me? People want to know, what's, what is this? What are you made of? That you could smile at me and call me friend and at the same time put a dagger in my back. That's not a good thing. We need God in our life. That's the person for sure you can trust. You can trust. And there are some people in this world you can trust. You just got to be cautious and know who they are. Sometimes I don't think we spend enough time uh, really getting to know people before we claim them as a friend. I don't call everybody my friend. I have some people I know, but everybody's not my friend. Neither is everybody yours. So you got to stop for me and say, where I am in my life right today, does that have something to do with somebody who I expected more from and they, I didn't get it? Or I expected them to stand with me in time of crisis, but they weren't there? This, is, this happens on a constant. In ministry, you can't, even, you can't even go there for how bad it is. Look, Listen to what the Living Bible puts this this way that I just read to you. It said, the good man have disappeared from the earth. Not one fair-minded man is left. They are all murderers turning against even their own brothers. They go at their evil, they go at their evil deeds with both hands and how skilled they are in using them. The governor and judge alike demand bribes. The rich man pays them off. Justice is twisted between them. Even the best of them are prickly as briars. The straightest is more crooked than a hedge of thorns. But your judgment day is coming. Ah, swiftly. Your time of punishment is almost here. Confusion, destruction, and terror will be yours. Don't trust anyone, not your best friend, not even your wife. Son despises his father, the daughter uh, defies her mother, and the bride curses her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be found in his own house. There's nothing worse than that. This is, this is, my, this is one of my siblings, or this is my sibling, or whatever. We were raised together. So I can trust my brother, I can trust my sister. So you think, and some, some of you may can, but it's a warning to those who have not proved something. Everything that we trust in anymore should be proven that it can be trusted. Over a period of time of knowing people, it will prove whether or not they're for real or not. It will prove whether or not they're really your friend. It will prove, uh, uh, I mean, it, it will prove whether or not you can really turn your back on this person, but you need time to prove it. I, when I watch you and the things that happen in my life and things that get difficult, and I watch where your stand is. Are you one that I can depend on? Are you really a friend? Friends are not fair weather friends. They're there when the storms are coming, when, when, when the tsunami hits, and when the hurricanes and all these things hit your life. Where are those people? Those are the people you can trust. The people you can trust when you ain't got no money is the people you can trust when you get some. That's a fact. If somebody wants to be your friend now, say, oh, my God, you know, I just want to be friends with you. For what, I just won the lottery? You want to be my friend? Don't think so. Old friends are the best. You've got a chance to know them, who they are, for sure. i got to know who you are. In ministry, I'm very cautious. Cautious. 
not afraid, but cautious. Because most of the time, the people that stab me in my back and my family in the back, they always look just like the people that just left. And you say, why you remind me of so-and-so? If they remind you of so-and-so, watch it. If so-and-so was bad, watch it. If they remind you of a good person, that may be a good thing. Keep watching and be sure you know who they are. If a person is your friend only when things are well, they're not really a friend. But the people that are there when it's difficult, when the time is rough, when sometimes you don't know whether you're going or coming, but they're there. You could ask them for a favor right now and they'd be willing to do it. I remember when my husband passed away, how the church people, I wouldn't trade them for a million dollars. They all came to my house. It was so crowded in there. I was sitting up in the middle of my bed and people were all over the floor, sitting in chairs, the men downstairs, everywhere. My house was full of people who cared about my family during a very difficult time. I shall never forget it. I think because of that, made what I had to go through a lot more simpler. Not as difficult, though it was difficult. But I realized that it could be more. But they were there saying, what can we do? Praying for me, supporting me, standing with me. I'm telling you, you cannot purchase that with money. These are people that from their heart, they speak to you. They tell you we care. If I get at least bit sick around here, you know what they do? Boy, they get a hold to God. These folks can do some praying up in here. Like Sister Rose, don't kick the bucket yet, honey. We need you around here a while. <laughs> it's true. What can, I mean, they're more value to me than any amount of money that anybody could give me. Because you care and you show that. And they say, I love you. You know how hard it is for some people to say, I love you? This look real crazy when you say, I love you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my, my, my mother was kind of that way, but of course she didn't raise me and we didn't have a, what you call a grand relationship because she was never there. But I, at the end, I tried my best to reach out to her more and more and show her that I loved her. And, and before I hang up the phone, I would say, Mom, I love you. Okay. That's not the answer. <laughs> if I say I love you, isn't, it, isn't the answer, I love you too? No, my mother could not say that. And I just think, what? Well, that's really sad. Because with my kids, we exchange love all the time. I love you. I love you. We care about you. Oh, this is any time. It don't have to be my birthday. Why do we think we can only say love talk if it's, a, if it's an occasion? No, every day. Because you don't know what day will be your last day. Make it count. When, when, when my husband left me the morning that he had the brain aneurysm, the last words we said, I love you, honey. He said, I love you too. He said, I'll be back shortly, which never happened. But I think, what we want to go back to what happened. Did I say it enough? That's why a lot of people have a lot of grieving going on when they, when they lose a loved one or a friend. Because you're, you're thinking, I never told them how I really felt. We sing the song sometimes, I give me my flowers while I live so I can smell them. Don't wait till I'm dead and fill it, fill it up around the casket. I can't smell it and I can't see it. But if you really care about me, could you just say it now while I can hear it? It means a lot. You don't have this, this connection in families like you should with people being able to share the inner feelings that they have for each other because uh, for some reason they're, they're, they've internalized all their emotions and they don't know if they should let them go and, and, and I don't know how my mother's going to feel about this or my dad and, 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 and they got this yoke. I had my daughter who died when she was 29 years old. Um, she was the only girl I had. Oh. Uh, Four girls. I have to always think we go, go the other way. But four girls. All my, three of my daughters will come to me with anything. They didn't never draw back. But this one daughter who was the twin, she would go to them and say, could you go ask mama for such and such a thing? And I thought, mama, uh, Anita wanted us to ask you about this. I started thinking, why did she ask me? If everybody else asks me, why can't she? And so I got her one day. I said, come here, Anita, let's talk. I said, 
Is there a reason why you always have to send a sister or brother to ask me something? They don't have no problem asking. I said, what is it? She just breaks down and starts crying. I said, well, that don't make sense. I'm trying, I'm trying to understand. <laughs> what is the problem? You can't talk to me? Did I do something or say something? No, mama, no. Why can't you talk to me? I want my daughters and my son to communicate with me. That's, that's important to me because when I was coming up as a kid, you're supposed to get somewhere, shut up, sit down. You ain't got nothing to say. You're a kid. Keep your mouth shut and be quiet. Well, I didn't want to raise my family. I want them to communicate with me. Tell me how you feel. And if you're troubled about something, let me know you're troubled. If you feel good, let's share that. After I had to talk with her, she changed. But I could have been as a mother just go on my merry way and say, well, I don't know what her problem is. No, I want to know why you can't talk to me. What's the issue? And she finally said, Mama, you know what? I don't even know why I feel withdrawn. Like I, I can't say that to her. Of course you can. So she started doing it. I said, now, don't that feel better? Yeah, it does, Mama, it does. And I said, so if you ever have anything you want to ask me, you're going to have to do it. Your sister brother can't do it. That's how she came out. Because she had some things she wanted to ask for whatever reason. I mean, I whooped all my kids real here when they were bad, but and hers wasn't no worse than the other one. And so, okay, but I got it out of her. I pulled it out. Let's talk. Let's share. I don't want to, uh, I don't want you to feel like you can't talk to me. I'm mom. Share with me. Because we couldn't share a lot of things with our family. And S-E-X, oh. Oh, you better not. You dare not. So I said to my grandmother one day when she said um, she wants me to be a good girl and uh, go to school. And I said, well, do you think we, we could have a boyfriend? No, you can't have a boyfriend. Well, why not? Because I said so. No, why not? My friends have boyfriends. Is there a reason? She said, ain't none of them no good. I thought, well, you got married to one and had 10 children, so somebody was some good. So I want to know what's going on here. No, you can't do it. But I didn't understand certain things you just couldn't bring to the table. I said one day, as a kid, maybe I was 12, 13 years old, I'm not sure, and I said to my grandmother, Mom, uh, Grandma, where did, where did God come from? You know what she said? If you ask a foolish question like that, like that again, I'll slap you right in the mouth. I didn't consider it foolish. What she should have said is that I don't know. He's always been. Don't talk about knocking my teeth out. Tell me if you know where he came from. Well, everything comes from something. So now we're talking about God. I'm just asking a question. So where did God come from? You don't ask a fool, a talking like a fool. I'm thinking, you just don't know how to answer it. And you should have just been honest and say, honey, I don't know. He's always been. That would be an answer. Couldn't get it. So I'm saying to you today, sometimes we are not able to interact with each other and trust each other because we don't know each other. We don't know enough about each other. I'm convinced the black and white races today would be together like this if they knew each other. We don't know each other. So, so what, what I may say to you as a black person, you say to me as a white person, can be totally different and mean the same thing. But we don't get a chance to know each other. And so how can you trust somebody if you haven't put time in to where I can trust you? I feel good about you. I feel good about this relationship. I feel like this is a thing that's going to work for us. For one thing, we both feel the same way about friendship, about caring, all these things. I said to my daughter one time when she came to me and told me one of her friends um, did something and she thought it was bad. And I said, well, do you understand what friendship means to her? No, I don't. I said, so you're going to be complicated by the fact that I'm not sure What's friendship to her? Because what I'm expecting as a friend, I'm not getting that. So then find out who she is. Maybe that's not going to be your friend. See, but I think if Jesus could look at Judas about to betray him and call him friend, that meant his love for him.
him went beyond where his was. I truly love you, Judas, but you don't care about me. You want to sell me out? And when they had the Lord's Supper, they were all sitting around the table. Oh, he said, one of you shall betray me. And the disciples started saying, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? And even Judas asked the same thing. Uh, he wasn't no good. So as we, as we look at this, we think, okay, now John, they called the beloved disciple. They said he laid in Jesus' breast, on his breast, and he wanted, Lord, is, who is it? He cared. But Judas was always Judas. It took time for it to manifest itself. And that's the way it is with people in your life. They are who they are. They've always been that. Just wait a little while. Watch it. Be careful with it. And say, you know what? I'm going to check this out. It doesn't mean I just jump up on you and say, oh, my God, I consider you my best friend. And we just met yesterday. No. You're opening yourself up for danger. But I can't imagine you're getting ready to die for the man who's getting ready to betray you. You're getting ready to give your life so he'll have a chance and he's getting ready to betray you. And when he got up from the table, Jesus said to him, whatever you do, do it quickly. He went out and got the scribes and Pharisees and brought them. Say, hey, here he is. Here he is. Can you imagine yourself for a moment in that position and this person that you love and cared about is standing now with your enemy. Can you believe that? And you're looking and saying, John, John, you're with them? Yeah, I'm on their side. Oh, we had an incident with a lady in our church a couple of weeks ago. And this woman was her enemy. When... She showed up that this thing could be resolved. Who was with these people? Her enemy was her son that she gave birth to and her brother. And when I saw the picture, I said, are you kidding me? Your son? I'm a different kind of mom. I probably would be in jail already. <laughs> Let's hope not. But I couldn't believe that you're standing there on that side with my enemy. You come back with them and you're making fun of me and I'm your mother? Whoa, whoa. The Lord said, I won't put more on you than what you could bear. That didn't happen to me with my kids. My kids had common sense. You don't play with mama, she'll play with you, but don't play nothing against her. I can't believe that this is your son. You took care of nine months and took care of him, and now he's standing with your enemy? I was more upset than she was. I said, what was he doing there? I wanted to see him so bad. I said, how did you do that to your mother? But betrayal is alive and well. And the scripture says, it, it come, it's coming a time that your enemies will be those of your own house. The people that you live with that you call brother and sister, that you call mom and dad. The time will come at some point the devil is going to do his best to turn people against each other. God doesn't turn people against each other. The devil does that. He doesn't want you to get along. He doesn't want you to love each other. He doesn't want you to care. But you got to say, wait a minute, what is this? I'll tell you about a boy in the word, and I don't know if I got it all here yet. Um, it, 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 everybody knows the story about Joseph. And Joseph, his brothers hated him. Joseph was his father's old age son. Something about when a man is finished and he knows he's finished, and suddenly he gets a baby, he feel like, whoa, let me flex my muscles some more. Wow, I'm still, I'm still going strong. Well, that's how Joseph came about. And so his brothers didn't like him because his father loved him because he was the son of his old age. And they made him a coat of many colors. That was a coat of honor. They hated him. And I remember when they, when they, when they 
saw him coming after the brothers had gone, and the father said, go seek them out where they are. He went to seek them out, and when they saw him come, he said, here comes that old dreamer. Sometimes you're hated by your own family and friends because you are, you're a dreamer, because I dream of big things. Some people mostly, I mean, dream of, about being a big grasshopper. Somebody's green is, is excited because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something with my life. I'm going places and they'll resent you for it. Like, so what makes you think you're going to get there? Because I believe I can. And here, here, Joseph's brothers come and, and they said, let's kill this dreamer. He done dreamed that he saw us bowing down to him. Let's get rid of him. Who do he think he is? And they put him in a pit. And his brother standing there, the younger brother said, don't kill him because they planned to kill him. But they didn't. He made it through all of this. And he became a great person in Egypt. They thought they got rid of the dreamer. They thought, we don't need you around. But the truth of, but the truth was still yet to come is that my, I'm, you, my brothers are going to bow to me. He wasn't an arrogant person. He was a person that was humble. But when, when, they, when they put him uh, in the hole, then they took him out and they took his, his beautiful coat and dripped it and, and, and had an had a animal they killed and just took his coat and put it in the blood and took it back to the dad and said, our, our brother, he's dead. Got a problem. The father wept and wept and wept. But you know what? The time came. That's what you got to realize. At some point in time in your life, no matter who's done you wrong, They've got to answer for it. But they're not going to answer if you're full of hate and bitterness against this person. You're hurting yourself. You're destroying yourself. Let it go. You have to let go. If you don't let go, it will destroy you. Joseph went to Egypt. He, he went to prison. He went through all this stuff. But you know what? He did not hold it against his brothers. And when he saw them, the scripture says he wept. He cried. He recognized them as it was 20 years later. He recognized them, but they didn't recognize him. Why? Because he's in a different place. And, but when he found out, when he looked at them and thought, these are my brothers, he played a little game with them, which wasn't bad. And so, but for the most part, he, God did this. He allowed me to come ahead of time for you. Think about it. Quit begrudging people of, of positions. Quit begrudging your sister or your brother because they do well in something. You can do well in what you're doing. Don't try to be your brother or your sister. You don't have to be. One thing I learned with my children, I had to accept each one for who they were, and they were all different. You say, how did you get seven kids, and they're all different? They were different. And I thought, you look at this one and you think, wow. Where did that come from? Y'all said, that, said, that come from your side of the family. I said, no, it didn't. <laughs> no, no. And if I saw somebody, I said, Charles, that looks just like your side of the family. That sounds like something they would do. But you look at these kids, they're all different. And some things that you have, they don't have. Not, I mean, just because you gave birth to them don't mean they're going to be just like you. Wait till they start growing up. I would always take my kids out of school time to buy them uh, uh, you know, you know, get a little school wardrobe and fix them up and stuff. And my twin who passed away took her out to get, get her school clothes. And when I got in the store, I said, oh, Nita, I said, look at these shoes. They, these are nice for school. She said, I don't like those. <laughs> well, see, all the way up until this time, whatever I like, that's what they like. I mean, I, mean, I, I mean, this girl done grew up a little bit and changed a little bit, and you're telling me you don't like it? I said, what do you mean you don't like it? She said, Mama, I don't like that shoe. I said, that's the cutest thing you could do for school. I don't like it. I said, okay. I got real mad. Because I thought, look, I've been picking your shoes forever. I didn't know she had grown up. So we went to another store. I said, Nita, what about this? No, I want those. I said, well, those almost look like the one you just said you didn't want. No, she said, Mama, these are different. I said, well, they don't look different to me. I'm still got, I still got stuff going on. I said, well, get them then. I'll pay, but take it to the counter. But I'm really perturbed with you because all these years I picked this stuff. You ain't had a problem with it. All of a sudden, I don't like your taste. That's not going to work. Well, honey, 
She got in the car. I said, I'm going to take you back home. She said, okay. I pulled up in the driveway. I said, get out. <laughs> I'm really perturbed because it has not dawned on me. She doesn't have to like what I like. But I never had witnessed this before. I mean, she always said, Mama, yes, if you like it, I like it. All of a sudden, I don't like that. Well, I got a problem with you. <laughs> had to learn how to say, let them go. What her taste is and yours is different. I tell my daughter sometime now, and, and they say the same thing to me. Mama, Mama you going to wear that? Yes, I am. I don't, I don't care for that. I didn't buy it for you. <laughs> Did I need your approval? Thank you. So I said to my daughter, I said, I said, what's that? Why don't you buy that funny looking African garb from? <laughs> Mama, this is my taste. But I learned from Nita, you better leave it alone. Let them wear it if they want to. <laughs> okay, okay. So now I just accept it. That's, that's them. That's what they want to do. They're different from you. But you know what? I'd rather have a relationship and don't worry about the type of garb you got on and have an issue over that. Let's just have a relationship. Let's get along with each other. Nothing is worse than in a house where there's confusion and people are bickering and running each other down and, and going through all this stuff. That's horrible to live like that. But if you stay with them, you've been raised with them all your life, you know who they are and they know who you are. And through all of that, I can, I can, establish, somebody, I can establish something that I can trust and believe in. This is what the word says. David said, Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. We ate, we ate lunch together yesterday. And then he turned on me, still eating my chicken. <laughs> we got a problem with that. He wants to say, give me my chicken back. I thought we were friends. He said, this is my familiar friend here. I know this person. And he rose up against me to fight against me. My familiar friend. Oh. Oh. How painful. Listen to this. David said, it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. I could have handled that. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man, mine equal, my God and mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of God in company. We went to church together, the same church. He said, this is the one that's hurting me. You sit next to somebody in church and says, so-and-so is my friend. She is, yes. And I have had to deal with that over the past 40 years of dealing with people to say, well, she thought you were her friend. Are you alarmed that she's in pain? Are you alarmed that she feels hurt by your action? Of course. Stop for a minute. And say, you know what? I never thought about that. I don't expect you to treat me bad. You are my equal. We go to the same church. We say we're Christians. We say we love God. And you could do this? One lady came to this church from another church in town. This is me uh, several years ago. And she said, Sister Rose, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. And she said, what do I do? This woman's heart was burdening in pain. She said, I was in this church in town. And my husband and another woman had an affair. And he told me, don't complain about it. Just stay with him. She said, what do I do? I thought, I usually don't tell people to leave their mates. Not unless somebody is beating you to death. And if you can't see the whip coming, hopefully somebody can help you to say, oh, that person's not worth that. She said, what, what do I do? The pastor's with my husband. I said, well, he shouldn't be. If your husband is doing wrong and committing sin in the church and, and he's, he's got a woman in the church that he's dating right in the church under your nose. And she said, but I thought she was my friend. I said, I understand. I understand. I said, honey, 
you've got to you got to come to a point in your life you make a decision you make a decision one lady came to me and said sister rose i don't know why my husband's doing this and he's doing that and i said well is he having an affair no ma'am he would never do that <laughs> everything you're telling me right now says affair affair and she's looking at me and I'm thinking, you don't know it's an affair? Because he wouldn't do that. I said, well, baby, the things that he's doing to you is what a man does to a woman when he's not right. He's not demonstrating love to you. Can you trust him? Not really. Love is about trust. If I love you, I have to be able to trust you. And so we find this going on in the church world as a whole, people are, people going with each other's husband, this one going with somebody in the choir, and this one doing something over here. I've been raised in church all my life. I saw some things, things I didn't understand. And I did not understand how my uncle could be superintendent of the Sunday school and his wife a Sunday school teacher and because everybody in our family, you don't talk about nothing. And my uncle had uh, had got to the place that, I mean, sex, he wasn't sexually active at all. The, something, I mean, the Lord punished him for something he had done wrong. Too long a story to get into. And his wife comes in the church pregnant. But see, I done eavesdropped around the corner. <laughs> and I'm thinking... And somebody said something about Uncle Percy can't have sex, so how did she get pregnant? Because you better not ask any grown-up that question. But I was going to figure that one out. And so I listened a little while longer when they get in the room and say, yeah, all you children get outside and go play. I ain't going to I'm listening to outside that room. What's going on? And then I hear that Aunt Fanny's been unfaithful to Uncle Percy and and she got, she's going to have a baby in the church, and, and, but the church don't know he's, uh, I mean, sexually, he can't really have any, anything coming from that. So I'm thinking something is wrong. So I heard my uncle say to her, I love you, but I never trust you ever again. I don't. So I get around and ask people, what, you know, what does that mean if he can't have sex but his wife is pregnant? Is something wrong with that picture? <laughs> yeah. They say, I was always too curious. She's all, uh, you, be sure Rose is gone. She listens to everything. Well, nobody told me about life. I had to find out some kind of way. But this kind of stuff is a hurting thing. It can be very embarrassing. It can be shameful. And I thought, whoa, come on. And you continue to teach Sunday school. And you can, he, he, he wasn't the one that was wrong, but she was. Why didn't you remove her? She shouldn't be teaching children. What are you going to tell her? You should be an example. I didn't get it. But as I got older, I get it. Now I look at things. Now I don't have to eavesdrop because I know what's going on. This is what's happening here. But if I want to have a friend and somebody that I'm not going to suffer pain from, and I'll marry somebody who I believe until death do us part. Until death do us part. Those words, I think, are taken too lightly. Till death do us part. I will always be here for you. You will always be here for me. And then we walk away, and women said to me, Sister Rose, what he, he, the things he told me, it, I believed it. And look at this, what happened? And then he says, I think we just grew apart. No, love don't grow apart. It continues to come together. 34 years was I married, and I didn't love my husband any less when he died than the day I met him. Understand. Be careful who you pick for a mate. Be careful the decision you make and trust a secret to a friend that you call a friend. Only to find out this friend is talking about you like a dog. Telling everybody else about it. No. Watching my uncle said this years ago, a dog that will bring a bone will also carry one. And it's true. If they're talking against somebody to you, they also will talk about, about you to somebody else. 
No people. If they're a gossip, stay away from them. You can't trust gossips. That's what they feed off, off of every day. They have to have new gossip. Stay away. Say, I'm going to be a friend. I, no, 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 no. I'm not looking for a friend right now. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> no. Leaders always have people in the church who have to, they work with. You, got, you can't do this job by yourself. It's impossible. So you've got ministers, you've got uh, deacons, you've got singers, you've got musicians, and, and all these people, they play a role in ministry. So God never designed it for you to do it all. And believe me, I don't even try. And, but you've got to know who's handling everything. You've got to know who takes the money to the bank. That they didn't stop and get them some chicken on the way. <laughs> You got to believe they did that all the offering is still there. Who are you? It's been cut short. Who's who cut it? See? I don't have anything to do with, with offerings. Uh, my two daughters is back in that room counting money, then they turn it over to the one of the chairman of the board and his wife, they recount it and then they take it to the bank. But you gotta have people you can trust. I don't want you around here wearing a new dress off some church offering. <laughs> No, that's not going to work. So, 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 so where did you get get the money to get? Oh, I just got, got a few hundred dollars out the offering. Really? No. You got to be able to trust some people. Moses had 250 princes of the assembly, and they came together and conspired against him um, and said, Why do you think you're so great, Moses? You ain't the only one so holy. God can talk to all of us. And Moses began to weep and cry that they had came against him. 250, that's a lot of people to, to conspire to come against you. And, but God got them, though. Dathan and Abiram let it, let it out. And they talked against him, tried to put him down to God, said, bring them out here, let me talk to them. And the scripture says, Moses said to God, God, don't let this man... Don't let any of these men die a natural death, but rather let something unusual happen to them that, that you send the message that you have called me to do what I've done and for what they've done. Don't let it be no, a normal death, but rather let the earth open her mouth and swallow them up and all that appertain to them. Can you believe that? An earthquake. While he's saying that immediately, the earth opened up its mouth and Dathan and Abiram and their family and everybody that was with them went down in that hole into the pit called hell. It's, it's dangerous to pick at people. It's dangerous to just be a fault finder. Give me the benefit of the doubt. I give it to you. And I'm not asking you to excuse any wrongdoing because no pastor or spiritual leader should be doing wrong if they're going to lead you. They shouldn't be doing it. Yes. They wanted to get rid of Jesus for one thing because he told them the truth and then he healed a man on the Sabbath day that had a withered hand and they said, we need to get rid of him. Why? Isn't it strange seemingly that people that are good, that deserve for you to treat them nice and respect them, that's the people that don't get it? But the crooks, they get it. All the liars, they get it. But you're doing what's right, and they don't want to do, they don't want to treat you right. Stop for me and say, ask yourself, you know, I know what betrayal feels like. A lot of hands went up in here this morning in reference to that. So I know what it feels like. And so, God, I'm asking you to help me never to be the person that causes anybody pain in their life because of something bad I did to them. Pray that prayer. Because you can't stop people from coming to you, but you surely can control what you do to somebody. Now, I'm not going to be that kind of person. I'm going to care about people, and I'm, not, I'm a person you can trust. Me and Daisy have been friends for, what, 50 years? Yeah? We've been together that long. Her children and my children were pretty much raised together. We have never, never, had a problem of mistrust with each other. Never. 
And when she met me, she said, Rose, I, I felt like when I first met you, I could trust you. I said, I'm trustworthy. I'll do it right. I'm not going to hurt anybody. If I hurt you for the truth, I'm not going to apologize for that. You just need that. <laughs> That's a good little spanking the Lord gave you to try to put you in line. Don't get mad with me. He did that. Okay? But we can, we've been friends for all that time. Our kids, I mean, it's like they're all brothers and sisters. Been together that long. And when I left, left the States and went to Germany, she wasn't even in the military. She got her a ticket and came over there and lived over there. We've been together every in all different things, tough times, good times, all kind of things. But understand, if you're going to choose a friend, try them. Prove them. See if they are really friends. What's their record? What's their pattern? Do they really function as a friend or you really can't trust them? Don't leave yourself wide open for pain. If you can avoid it, don't get, don't let it be open like this. You know, keep your heart protected. A broken heart's a horrible thing. And the only person that can heal it is God. But he'll heal you if you've got one this morning. Maybe you're sitting here thinking, I think God's talking to me because, you know, I came this morning. I still to this day, I hurt over what happened to me, over what they did to me. Even when I see them together, I just still feel that pain. God can heal it. He can make you whole again. I've been betrayed, 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 betrayed. And I'm not bitter against anyone. I love people in spite of. No matter what has happened, it doesn't change my heart's feeling. That's where you got to get. Where you're not bitter, you're not mad. If I got the chance, I'd, I'd give you to the buzzards. Come on. But if you're sitting there this morning and say, well, my mom did it to me, my dad did it to me, or a cousin I had that did it to me, ask God, the Lord, heal my heart. Take away pain help me to see this person and all I want to do is pray for them I don't want to hurt them don't hurt back say I'm not going to do it it's a sad thing but he can heal you of it he can do it with you he did it for me I can't count my betrayals in ministry that's common that's as common as drinking water common they smile at you, they shake your hand, say, I love you, Sister Rose, but they will beat your brains out. I experienced it all. But I'm, I'm still a whole person because I didn't let any situation take control of me and change me into this evil person. I could even be a minister or a pastor with those type feelings. You got to be able to say enough is enough. I'm not going out like that. I'm going to be happy. I, I, I choose to be happy. I choose to go on with my life. Or, or otherwise, you're going to let somebody else empower you by continually feeling evil against them. You're giving them the power to continue to control your life. Let it go. While our singers and musicians are coming forward, if you're sitting there this morning and say, Sister Rose, you know what? This has got to be for me. It's got to be for me. God will help you to get through it. I was betrayed by a son, two sons. One of them made, made it right with God and made it back. The other one, the betrayal was beyond, beyond words. Beyond words. He called my other son the other day and said, tell mama, I understand why she don't want me in her life. I can't have it. I don't hate you. I'm not mad at you. Or nothing, but I can't ever get to the place that I can trust you. But I don't hate you. The pain was assistant pastor of this church, and I had to kick him out because he wasn't no good. You may have somebody you need to put out of your life. Well, why? Because they ain't no good. So I don't, I don't want to say that. I say that. Oh, my God. You just, I mean, you call him no good? Yes. I'm not a politician. I call it like it is. Here it is. 
That's the way it is. You either good or you bad. You either worth something or you're not. You either going to heaven or to hell. You either a Christian or you're not. You can talk around and talk about it all you want to. Are you one? So if you may be having some bitterness and something in your heart that bothers you and you still, it still hurts. When you think about it, it hurts. I know. The lady that won me to the Lord many years ago, um, I was very close to her. She was like a mother to me. Lord, that woman betrayed me to the point I thought I would never heal, but I did. Two years after she did all that stuff to me, I still would cry. But I'm here to tell you today that God can change all that and make you whole because you're not going to begin to live with that inside. You're not going to ever be really happy as long as that's in, back in your mind. You won't be really happy. I'm happy today. She's passed away. I left from the state of Washington. My husband was in Vietnam. When he got there, I said, get me out of this city as quick as you can. I cried all the way down the highway. He said, oh, you wouldn't believe the pain, the pain, the pain. You, you, you brought me to Jesus, and then you cut my throat. But that's long gone. I don't have any bitterness against anybody. Ask yourself. Search yourself. Don't lie about it. Look at yourself and say, I do have these feelings inside. I think I should be honest and tell you I don't feel right, but I want you to forgive me. Move on. Life is too short to live it bogged up in a knot somewhere and can't, can't live. If you really want to live, you got to love people. You got to love your enemies. He said love your enemies. When I got saved, I thought, God, that's a tough one right there. Love your enemies? And those that despitefully misuse you, uh, give them something to eat? You want to beat them up? You ain't want to feed nobody. <laughs> but after you save a while, you learn that you can do it with, with him. Because he puts love in your heart.